Yeah, who? <laughs> I would come up here and um, husk corn uh, to get away from the Dutch oven that I live in. It's uh, in Phoenix, Arizona. So uh, just thank you, please. Have me back. Uh, never in the winter, I'll never come. Uh, but if you'll have me uh, in the summer, I will come and do nearly anything. Uh, a reminder, you cannot live a successful and happy Christian life without these books. Um, you think I'm joking, you can't. Um, um, if theoretically, you can still go to heaven without reading these, <laughs> but your um, seating, you'll have an obstructive view, like a, like a pole in front of you or something, and um, there will be a cap on how much pie you can have each day. And uh, I could be wrong on this, but why would you take the risk, really? <laughs> these books, this is The Cure, and what's cool about the cure is at the end of every chapter there's links that take you to hours and hours more of teaching to how do you develop how do you live out how do you enjoy with your family with your friends your church your business uh, in an environment of grace what does that look like and what does that feel like and then we get in a small group and we play this out and we look about, we talk about taking the filter off the scriptures, the moralistic and shame filter off the scriptures. Powerful, powerful. And then in the back, there's all these videos and DVDs of uh, pieces that help kind of form this scenery and this uh, landscape of an environment of grace in Christ. So um, I don't think we have any with us this service, but on the back of the book, it tells you uh, cross-section, how to order them and save a lot of money when you buy them more than one at a time. In Romans 6.14, it says, it's an incredible statement. It's almost unbelievable. It, it, unless we just read it in a hurry religiously, it blows us away that he can make such an astounding statement. He says, For sin shall not be master over you, for you are no longer under law, but under grace. Sin does not have to master you anymore. Something happened to you, and you are no longer under moralism, under buck upism, under try harderism, under you oughtism, under any ism, you're under grace. Grace. And because of it, sin won't be master over you, because you're no longer having to see this thing as a, as a saved sinner. Someday I'm a miserable, wretched man, but someday I may grow into something that God can almost endure. <laughs> no, I'm a saint who still sometimes sins. Instead of seeing this book as a book of you ought, you should, what's wrong with you, when will you? Come on! After all he's done for you, you, you let's go! Appealing to the flesh that's unredeemable. Instead, I see this as a book of, hey kid, this is what you get to do. This is who you are. This is what your heart, your new redeemed heart has been longing to do. And I start to appeal to Christ in me. Do, did you realize? Of course you do. But we forget to draw on it. I am fused with Christ. She told it. I don't know where he ends off and I start up. Completely righteous. With his righteousness. And he says, kid, I want you to live out of that. Instead of this shame. By the way, I, I took that shame to the cross with me. It's no longer your identity. But sometimes it feels like it is. You know what shame does? Shame says, uh, not just that you did something wrong, but there's something particularly wrong about you. And it'll never change, no matter what you do, no matter how much you grow, no matter anything else, this is who you'll always be. That's what shame says. But it's hard. It's hard to believe this grace. It feels like we're getting away with something. 
And all that goes is back to the garden. It goes all the way back to when Adam and Eve ate the fruit in that real event, in that real place, on that real day. You remember what it says in Genesis chapter 3, where he says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And so they, this is the first act of sin management in history. History's pretty short at that time uh, with humans and stuff, but still. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. And then they heard the sound of the Lord God in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And then the Lord God called to the man and said, Hey, where are you? Knowing full well where he was. And he said, Well, um, I heard the sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid because for the first time I realized I was naked. And that feeling of shame, it was too much. I never felt that before. And it felt so empty and dead and scary and alone. I hid myself. I was afraid because I realized I was naked, so I hid myself. And a stone drops into a giant pool whose concentric circles spin out and pour out and whose DNA wash over every man, woman, and child in history. All the way to me. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And so now when John Lynch, when, when something happens, I get afraid, I get embarrassed, I get exposed, or I do something, or something's been done to me that convinces me that I'm not enough, that I don't match up. I put on the mask, I hide. I can't, I can't risk feeling that. As early as we can remember, we've performed for acceptance. If I'm good, talented, beautiful, together, competent, right enough, I'll be loved, accepted, and happy. And if I'm not, I'll be pitied and patronized and rejected, and I'll live a second-class life. You know, it's like, it's, it's, um, I always call it, it, it's the Santa Claus is coming to town theology. <laughs> we made Santa Claus, well, the truth is, we created Santa Claus because we couldn't handle God. Truth is, we can't handle Santa Claus. We made him all jolly and sassy and chubby, but the truth is the guy is a controlling legalist with almost unlimited power. <laughs> you'd, um, you'd uh, better watch out. <sighs> you'd better not cry, you'd better not pan, I'll tell you why. The Santa Claus, he's a coming to town. Oh, he's making a list. <laughs> he's checking it twice. He will find out. Hey, do a noise. And the big guy, he's coming to town. He sees you when you're sleeping. Which in my book is wrong, okay? All right? I don't care. That, that's a bad fairy tale when, he, when big old Santa starts visiting you in your home at night in your bedroom. No! Ah! Santa, get out of my bedroom. I don't care if you're old jolly and sassy. You shouldn't be in here. He knows when you're awake. He knows when you've been back. Good. So be good for uh, goodness sake. And your worth is on how much you do right and how little you do wrong. And he's always writing stuff down. He's going to find you out. So you better watch out. You better fear this guy. You better stop sniveling. You better not pout. You better put on a good face and act like you're somebody better than who you actually happen to be. Dance better. Put on a good show. Just be better than who you are, for goodness sake. <laughs> Don't be a whiner. Fix yourself. Try harder. Do more. Do better. Don't have so many problems. Watch over your shoulder and get better in a hurry. And if you can't, bluff like you are because you're constantly on trial. If you want good things to happen in your life, you had better figure out how to keep this guy happy. Isn't that crazy? It's on our billboards. It's webbed into our DNA. All the way back from the fall. Genetically wired, still there, even though I'm a brand new creature. 
We learn early on how to perform and the highest value is being accepted and the means of acceptance appears to be right appearance. And there's the problem. Because I fail. I mean, really fail. And my failure feels weirder and more shameful than I imagine yours to be. And that's the problem. Because I live with this... Um, I live with this secret awareness of just how poorly I'm doing and how little I've grown. I feel unfit, unworthy, unlovable. I'm naked. Gosh, I can't live with that. And I can't have you see that. I can't have you pity me. So no one must know. I've got to mask myself with enough reasons to be loved. I've got to brag. I've got to put others down. I've got to act healthier. I've got to idealize myself. Posture, bluff, keep on a smile, avoid correction, justify, rationalize, hide the real me. And in the midst of it, here comes the gospel. For some of us, the very first time, for some of us, the 527,000th time. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to actually become sin on my behalf, that, that I would become the righteousness of Christ in him. What? Are you kidding me? He, God, before the world began, the two got together, the three got together, and decided, are you ready, kid? I love you so much, are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. He the Father, He actually made the Son allowed to be sin. Represent all my sin, actually become it. All of your sin, all of mine, all of Sir Francis Drake's sin, everybody in all of human history. He became it, paid for it, felt it, experienced it, so that I, who deserved none of it, would become actually, really, not just forensically or judicially or poetically or, or theoretically, that I'd become the, the righteousness of God in him. I'm like, we're clothed in righteousness by the willing of God to become, the willingness of God to become naked and suffer our penalty. And so we believe it. We find ourselves going, I can't believe you. Okay. And the pattern gets broken and new wiring immediately fills my circuits. And we, 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 we start to actually dare believe that, that we're lovable just because he chooses to love us, that we're delighted in, that we're holy and righteous. We begin believing that he created us lovable. He made us exactly who he wanted. He wanted there to be a John Lynch on this planet at this time. He just had to break through the chasm of sin separation. This radically remakes us. And then something happens. I don't know, you tell me. I don't know, something... I don't know, maybe you go through a season where you don't experience his love as much or you feel dry or maybe you fail God in some way that you said that you would never do again. And subtly, gradually, like smoke, it slips back under the door and the lie reawakens. You begin to presume a sense of his absence or bad circumstances must be due to his displeasure with you. So the cycle starts up again. <sighs> okay, I can do this. I've so got this. I got this. I got this. You, you, you shore things up. You're going to straighten the magazines. You're going to set some standards. You're going to get serious about your behaviors. You're going to manage things. You're going to, you, you, things got a little wild, but you're going to get it back into, you're going to polish things up and the river's going to flow again. And one of these times, and I don't know when it will happen for you. I know when it happened for me. God will say that's enough. You'll, you'll, you'll have been walking along the Christian life, just doing one path, just kind of walking along, then suddenly, boom, right in front of you, one path will become two. 
You'll come to an intersection right in front of you, a giant pole in front of you. And you look way, way up. And, and uh, uh, there's an arrow kind of heading out in this direction. You look down, there's a giant path, uh, a long, long path. It says, trusting God. Over here, there's another path, and, and you see an arrow pointing down there, and it says, pleasing God. I don't want to pick either of the two of those. I just want to go on with my, life, my Christian life, but there they are. Those are both wonderful, but they're not going away. You're going to have to pick one of the two of them. And it will be for the rest of your journey, the initial motivation of your heart from here on in. You stand there and you stare and it doesn't go away. So eventually you look up and there it is, a trusting God. You look down the path and you think, ah, oh, man, I don't... Trusting God doesn't give me anything to do. I don't know what to do with that. Okay, just stay there. Uh, pleasing God. Now see, that sounds right. Pleasing God, because I mean like, that's right, I mean, it's, it's, oh gosh, so I see what's happening. See, after all he's done for me, I mean, what I want to do is I want to please him, I want to make him happy. Oh my gosh. So I, I get it. This has all been God bringing me to this place so I could finally make a decision and not live this half-hearted life so I could really sell out. Oh my gosh. Okay, so I start off on, on, the, on the pleasing path road and I, I, I walk along and I, I, I kind of go into some thickets and then eventually it turns into a bunch of tall trees and I'm, I'm in there for probably an hour, hour and 15 minutes and it breaks open into a clearing and I kind of turn around a bend and I spill out into this giant beautiful clearing and I can, I can, I can see a, a, an immense building way, way off in the distance. Another 10 minutes I keep walking. And I see that there's writing on this building. I mean, giant stadium of a building. It says, striving hard to work on my sin. I think, yeah, that's right. I mean, that's, of course, that's so great. Oh, this, is, this has got to be it. I'm, I'm so happy. Then I, I keep going and I see that there's a, a door. Another five minutes, I see there's writing on the door, and I get closer, and I see that there's two words right above the doorknob. Self-effort. I think, well, that's right. Finally, someone has the nerve to say it. That's exactly right. I mean, because, I, mean, I mean, God does his part, but I've got to do something, right? I mean, like, I mean, God helps those who help themselves. That's in Scripture, right? I mean, it's behind Malachi or something. It's, it's in there. And I think this is it. Oh my gosh, I'm going to be with the sold out people of God. And I open the door and I walk in. Huge, huge room. Cacophony of sound. Thousands of people. I'm thinking, this is it. I can't believe it. I, I stand there with my jaw dropping as I stare at this room full of people. And I don't notice as I'm standing there that behind me, there's a hostess in this room. And she walks up and says to me in a voice that is upon further reflection kind of slick, kind of oily. She says, hi, welcome to the room of good intentions. And I say, oh, thank you. I am so stinking excited to be here. You have no idea. This is, hey, how's everybody doing? Hey, how's everybody doing? And it gets quiet. One person finally steps forward and says, We're doing fine. <laughs> yep, we're fine. Fine is fine. Bobby, Dev, Carlos? Yeah, we're fine. We're just fine. Uh huh. That's us. <laughs> we're fine. <laughs> we're liquid. I mean, we've got a sense of our own corporate annuity and a dialectic of resurgence, and there's a whole... Kids are great. I mean, oh my God. Woo, we're doing just great. Great. We're, we're doing fine. Thank you for asking. Back at you, tiger. 
well, I think that's odd, but they're doing great. And then she asks me, how are you doing? And I say, <laughs> you don't want to know. I've been really struggling, battling. With, I mean, now that I'm here, I think the things are going to get better, but, but I've got to tell you, I, I have been, and she does this. And then she pulls from behind her a mask. And she nods for me to put it on. I don't, I, 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 I don't want to wear, wear a mask. I've never worn a mask in my whole life. But as I look and I hold the mask up, it looks a lot like the expression of almost all the people in this room, in this room of good intentions. I so much want to make it. I so much don't want to fail here. This is it. This is a song. What am I? I okay, 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 okay. Shh. And I put it on. And I find myself saying, um, <clears throat> thank you, I'm doing fine. Thank you. You're in the room of good intentions. And there's a banner on the back wall. I don't see it right away, but it's, it says this. Working hard on my sin to achieve an intimate relationship with God. Yeah, that's right. Working hard on my sin to achieve an intimate relationship with God. But that's exactly right, because I mean, because I can remember early on as a believer, he and I were so close, so close, but then something happened. I don't know what it was. I, I, the things I did wrong, things I said I wasn't going to do, and the things I said I would do, I, did, I didn't do them, and there became this mound of stuff. We used to be so close, so intimate, like, 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 like we were right next to each other, so close talking to each other, and now, over time, that mound has grown of that stuff, that failure, that sin, the fish bones and rotted coffee and, and wet cat food that's been left out for three weeks with mayonnaise mixed in and <laughs> mustard and carob and stuff. And it's hot and it's pussy and it's steamy and it's, and it's growing. And I can't see him, but I imagine he's over there now. Jesus is on the other side, and, but the vapor makes it too much for me to be able to see. But I imagine him over there, shaking his head with his arms folded, thinking, oh, God, I had so much hope for that kid. I thought he was, gosh, has he let me down. He, is, he has played fair. I don't want to hear it anymore. I don't want any promises. I'm sick. I mean, that's what I imagine. And I want to call out to him now, now that I'm in this room, and I want to say things are going to be... Things, I, I, I love you. I, I love you. I know that this... I know, but I'm sorry, and I'm going to fix this. This time, I promise, I really mean it. I'm going to get this... this taken care of, made smaller, and we're going to be closer, okay? I, I know. This time it's going to be different. But here's what nobody tells me in that room. Is that there's not a single thing I can do about any of that sin. I can't make it go away. And they're bringing truckloads more of it in each week. And what nobody tells me, too, is that while I'm wearing a mask, nobody gets to love me. Only my mask gets loved. But this room, you guys, oh my gosh, it, it has sincerity and perseverance and courage and diligence and full-hearted fervency and sold-out determination, the pursuit of excellence. Oh, yeah, this is it. I'm going to make him so happy. One day we're going to be so close. But weeks turn into months, and I notice that many here sound cynical. If you just listen to their conversations, they sound cynical, and they look pretty tired. And the conversations, if, if you listen, if you get up close, they're superficial and guarded. And if you catch them when they think no one's looking, there's deep, lonely pain in their faces. Come to think of it, I'm, I'm starting to think differently too. I'm no longer as relaxed. I, 
I have this nagging anxiety. If I don't behave, if I don't control my sin enough, I'm going to be on the outs with everybody in this room and probably with God too. So, I invest more effort into sinning less. And honestly, for a while, I do. I kind of feel a little bit better I, for a while. But despite all my striving and all my sincerity, I still sin. Over and over. Sometimes the same sin. Some days I get fixated on trying not to sin. I can't seem to do enough. I never get through my list. I never feel like I've done enough. It feels like I'm making every effort to please a God who never seems pleased enough. And quickly this path of pleasing God's turning into what in the world, what in the world must I do to keep him pleased with me? Guys, when we buy this theology, when we buy that whole room, we embrace, we, we reduce righteousness to a cheap formula. More right behavior plus less wrong behavior equals godliness. It sounds so good. The only problem with it is that it has to improve to reach up to heresy. It's garbage. It's dead. It's religion that kills you. You know what the problem with that is? It disregards the godliness and righteousness that God has already placed in me on my worst day. Yes, we mature. But if we disregard the righteousness that's already ours from trust, we are set up. We are set up to live in hiddenness. We can never resolve our sin by working on it. We may change a couple external behaviors for a while, like moving around the deck chairs on the Titanic, but when we strive to sin less, we don't. And it causes us to start to lose hope, and we, it keeps us immature. And even though this theology's been breaking our hearts, and though it's let us down a thousand times, we desperately keep hope, and maybe this time we'll be able to control and stop our bad habits and sins by enough sincerity and willpower. And I, I realize day by day, but now especially on this, I can't breathe. And I want to tell somebody, I want to say, hey, what, 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 what's wrong with me? Why does everybody seem like they're doing okay except me? And that's the one thing that nobody wants to talk about. So. Even though I know that this is the one place, the one chance I've got for, to be with the sold out people of God and to do this thing right, I can't, I can't breathe in here. And I walk out the door. And if I've ever been devastated, now I'm devastated. Because I don't know, what do I do now, now that I know this? I don't know where to go. I start wandering and I, about an hour and a half I wander and then I, uh, I look up and I notice, huh, I'm right back where I started. I'm at the crossroads. And I look over at this trust, trusting God arrow and I'm thinking, you're kidding me, right? Somebody, anybody, is there a third path? And I don't hear anything, so I start walking with almost no hope. But that's all I got. So I start wandering, same thing. And there's a, some thicket, and then it kind of grows into some woods. And I travel in that for about an hour and 15 minutes, and huge trees. And then eventually I turn and, and see that it opens up into a wide open clearing. Beautiful. Huge, huge building off in the distance here too. And I've got to walk another 15 minutes before. No, 20 minutes because I see what it says and I can't believe what it says. It doesn't make any sense. The words written atop the building say, living out of who God says I am. Well, there's one word right after another. What does that mean? I keep walking and I see that there's a door. There's a door in this building. Another five minutes and I see... There's one word written above the doorknob. 
It's the word humility. And it overwhelms me. For the very first time in my life, I say, help, help, help me, God, I can't do this. I've tried so hard to impress you. I've tried so hard to prove to you that I, but you're bigger, you're stronger, you're faster, you're more wonderful. And you're in me and I haven't let you. I can't do this, God. If there's going to be anything good that comes out of me, you're going to have to do it in me. I'm tired, I'm so tired of trying to prove to you that I'm enough. Help, help me. And I open the door and I walk in. Same thing, thousands of people, huge room, cacophony of sound. I am blown away, I'm overwhelmed again. I'm standing there with my jaw dropped and, and in this room too, unbelievably to me. While I'm looking out, there's a hostess in this room who is walking behind me. And she says to me in a voice that is maybe the most beautiful voice that I've ever heard my whole life. She says, Hi. Welcome to the room of grace. Well, I'm a little leery, okay? Because I've already been in a room. She's very cool, very hip. She says, listen to what she says. So how are you doing? <laughs> well, I've been here before. So I say, doing fine. Sort of, sort of fine. Who wants to know? And then I notice nobody in this room either is making any sound. So now I am sick and tired. I've had it. I am done with it. Finally, I rip off my mask and I go, hey, hey, everybody. Guess what? I'm doing not fine. <laughs> I haven't been fine for a long time. I'm tired and confused and afraid. I feel guilty and lonely. I am sad most of the time, okay? I can't make my life work. I'm so far behind and befuddled about what to do next. It leaves me frozen. And if any of you people knew half my daily thoughts, you'd want me out of your little room. So there, I'm doing not fine. Thanks for asking. Gotta go. And I reach for the back door knob, ready to leave the door and leave the room. And from way, way back in the room, someone yells out, That's it! That's all you got? I'll take your confusion and guilt and bad thoughts and raise you compulsive sin and chronic lower back pain. Oh, and I'm in debt up to my ears and I wouldn't know classical music from a show tune if it jumped up and bit me. You better get more than that little list if you want to play in my league, buddy. And the hostess leans over and says, I think he means you're welcome here. <laughs> you're in the room of grace. Grace, grace, a hundred and twenty-seven times in the New Testament. Grace, and you can't say it except for in Scottish or Irish, for this is the manner in which God speaks. <laughs> grace. Oh, and the Judaizers, Romans 5 through 8, they hated the concept. They said, Paul, don't you, you can't... You can't, these people, are, they're vermin. I know them, they're immature. They're gonna take advantage of it. They're gonna live half-hearted lives. They'll do Christianity in light. I've seen these people. You, Paul, you gotta keep the, the lid on. You gotta, you know what I'm talking about here? You gotta kind of work them. You, you, you can use a little grace, a little bit like paprika, you know, as a kind of an accent. But no, you gotta, I know these people. And Paul, in Romans 5 through 8, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, he says, Thank you so much, Judy I appreciate your sincere concern. And you'd have a really good point, except for two things. These vermin that you're talking about, um, they have a brand new identity. Who they are is lovers. I live in them. They're new believers. They're new creatures. Oh, and by the way, too, they, they have the third person of the Trinity living in, in them, the Holy Spirit. He's really whew, spooky powerful. I mean, he's, he, can, he can rebuke them, exhort them, stand right next to them, encourage them. 
Huh. See, the problem is because you have not told them that it's true and because you have kept them under moral ought that it tries to assuage their shame, you've made them into anesthetized rebels. And that's why they can't obey from the heart. So you can get compliance through any method you want, any theology you want, but to get heartfelt obedience where someone feels they can jump up into his lap, heartfelt obedience that wants to obey, I'll take grace. I'll take grace. Guys, it's all over Scripture. I don't know. It's like there's been a, a, a lens on our eyes. It's all over. I, I love what it, Paul says in, to Timothy. He, he knows he's about to leave this plan. And he says, Timothy, my son, don't forget, I want you to be strong. And you expect him to say, in, 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 in willpower and sincere diligence and discipline, I give you. He says, I want you to be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus, kid. Acts 20, 32, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which alone is able to build you up. Hebrews 4, 16, let's draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and may find grace that will help us in our time of need, those horribly hard, confusing, chronic times that don't go away, that feel like we'll never be able to squeeze through. Romans 5, 2, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've also obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. It's such a hard thing to believe because in the Old Testament, we, uh, we rebelled and we ran away because we only saw his authority and his power. And so Israel just rebelled over, ran away, came back, ran away, came back. In the New Testament, God says, I'm going to let you see my person. I'm going to turn over all the cards. Hi, it's me, Jesus, and I'm humble, humble and meek, and you'll find rest for your souls, you guys. Come here. Come here, don't run away. As much as my Father loves me to that exact extent, I love you. And, and so I wrote a piece called God's Great New Testament Gamble where, where, where it, said it feels like such a gamble on God's part. It's not a gamble on God's part, but it sure feels like it to us. Now, this is in the cure. He says, what if I tell them who they are? What if I take away any element of fear and condemnation or judgment or rejection? What if I tell them that I love them and I will always love them? That I can't love them any more than I love them right now and that I love them right now no matter what they've done as much as I love my only son? That there's nothing they can do to make my love go away. What if I told them there are no lists? What if I told them that they were righteous with my righteousness right now? What if I told them they could stop beating themselves up, that they could stop being so formal and stiff and weird and jumpy around me? What if I told them that I was absolutely crazy about them? What if I told them that even if they ran to the ends of the earth and did the most unthinkable, horrible things and were unfaithful in their marriages, when they came back, I'd receive them with tears and a party? What if I told them I don't keep a log of past offenses on how little they pray or how often they let me down or made promises they don't keep? What if I told them they don't have to be owned by men's religious additions or traditions? What if I told them if I'm their savior, they're going to heaven no matter what, it's a done deal? What if I told them that they had a new nature, that they were saints, not saved sinners, who should now buck up and be better if you were any kind of a Christian after all he's done for you? What if I told them that I actually live in them now? That I've put my love and power and nature inside of them at their disposal? What if I told them they never ever, ever had to put on a mask? That it was exactly okay to be who they are at this moment with all their junk and not pretend about how close we are, how much they pray or don't, how much Bible they read or don't? What if they knew that they don't have to look over their shoulder for fear if things get too good, the other shoe's going to drop? What if they knew that I will never, ever, 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 ever use the word ever, ever, ever use the word punish in relation to them? What if they knew when they mess up, I'll never get back at them? What if they were convinced that bad circumstances were my way of even the score for taking advantage of me? What if they knew the basis of our friendship was not on how little they sin, but on how much they let me love them? What if they had permission to stop trying to impress me in any way? What if I told them they could hurt my heart, but I tried to never hurt theirs? What if I told them that I kind of like Eric Clapton's music too? <laughs> 
the these and thous have always confused me, that I never really liked that Christmas handbell deal with the white gloves. What if I told them they could open their eyes when they pray and still go to heaven? What if I told them there was no secret agenda, no trap door? What if I told them it wasn't about their self-effort, but allowing me to live my life through them? That's the New Testament gamble. And we're the guinea pig test. Will our kids live double lives if we really let them have an environment of grace? Or would they, for the first time, live real, authentic, beautiful, free, God-obedient, deeply God-loving and trusting hearts? See, in Hebrews 11, it says it so powerfully. It shows the two roads. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith, pistos, is the word. It's the noun form of the verb trust. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. You see, if I'm all day long trying so hard to please Him, trying, trying to, if that's my motivation, if that's my number one motivation, then I'll never, I'll never learn to trust Him and I'll never please Him enough. But if over here, on my worst day, I dare believe that I wear a robe of righteousness, I dare believe that my name's, my, my name's Christ and John Lynch. I, I, I don't deserve, I don't feel like I, my name's Christ and John Lynch. And Jesus says, kid, you're doing it. You're doing it. You're trusting me. You're trusting who I say you are and who I say I am in you. And by the way, when you trust it, you will sin less. Oh, and by the way, you've never pleased me so much in your whole life, kid. Oh! That's living. See, pleasing God is, is incredibly a good desire. It just can't be our primary motivation or it'll imprison our hearts. For if all we bring to God is our moral striving to please Him by solving our sin, we're back in the same square that put us in need of salvation. We're stuck with our talents, our desire, our ability, longing, chutzpah, and diligence, and resolve to make it happen. Pleasing is not the means to our godliness. It's the fruit of our godliness. Because it's the fruit of trust. Well, here in the room of grace, there's a banner on the back wall, too. It says this. Standing with God with my sin in front of us, working on it together. What if the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary, what if it was this powerful that for those of you who have dared put your hope in Jesus Christ, He's never been over there on the other side of your sin. In fact, He walks all the way around and He walks all the way up to me and He stands in front of me. And he smiles that smile that no other human on earth can make. And he looks right into my eyes and he gets up so close and he says, I know, kid, I know, I know. I've known from before the world began. I'm not ashamed, I'm not mad, I'm crazy about you. I've got this, I've so got this, I love you so much. And then he'd stroke my hair and put his hands on my shoulder and then he would pull me into a bear hug. So tight! And say, I know, I know, I know, I know I'm crazy about you. And I would, I, at first I want to fight and say, I don't deserve this. No, 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 no. But then I don't want it to stop. I want it to go on forever. And he holds me. He just holds me there saying, I love you so much. And he holds me until he's convinced that I believe it. And finally, after the longest time, he lets go. Only enough so that he can do this. So that he can put his arm around me. And we can look at my sin together. Can you imagine? I always imagine this picture of Jesus doing that with me, and I imagine him looking at my sin going, <laughs> Wow! That's a lot of sin! Don't you ever sleep? <laughs> and 
And then he would say, we so got this kid. I got your back. I'm crazy about you. This is why they call it really, 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 really good news. Have we been changed? Yeah. Have we been changed? I get so sick and tired of going into bookstores and reading these ridiculous books. Man, time for us to change. Listen, you've already been changed. If you're a believer, you're as changed as you're ever going to get. As night as from day we've been changed. Now we get to mature into who we already are. See, this is in the cure. If we brought a caterpillar to a biologist and asked him to describe its DNA, he would say this, I know this looks like a caterpillar to you, but by every measurable scientific result, this is fully and completely a, a butterfly. Wow! God's wired into a creature looking nothing like a butterfly, a perfectly complete butterfly identity. And because the caterpillar is a butterfly in essence, it will inevitably and invariably one day display the behavior and attributes of a butterfly. In the meantime, yelling at the little guy to hurry up, it'll just hurt his tiny little ears. <laughs> the caterpillar matures into what is already true about it, and so it is with us. God gives us the DNA of godliness. We're saints, we're righteous. God knows our DNA. He says, he knows that I'm Christ in me. And now he's saying, John, will you believe it to be true? Because it will change everything. <sighs> well, now it gets personal. What about us? You walk in here. I tell you this because I, I am just like you. And I still feel it every time I go any place new. I still feel it sometimes in my own home church where I was the preaching pastor for 27 years. I feel like if you knew who I really was, you wouldn't want to be with me. If you knew who I really was deep inside, you'd pity me and you'd marginalize me. And so I hide from you. I put on a mask and I do the dance and I make myself look better or different than who I actually know I am because I still believe the shame story. What if, what if this beautiful place called Foundations Church, this growing room of grace that has decided to live this way for their lifetime, what if this place grew up in such a way that there was an atmosphere, a felt, palpable, tangible atmosphere that when someone walked in this room and they sat down, maybe the person next to them would say something like, That's it! That's all you got? Listen. It will be their way of saying, Kid, now and for the rest of your days, you're welcome here. <laughs> 